being exhibited and pushed by the young people. In Africa, as everywhere else in the developing world, there is no resource more valuable than the youth. Africa's population, for example, is incredibly young. Six out of every 10 people in sub-Saharan Africa is under the age of 25. It is the young who are most affected by poverty and war, political marginalization, and social exclusion. And they demand better, and they are demanding protection. But as events in North Africa have shown us, they are also perhaps the key component of any solution. These young people are not only going to be engines of economic progress, but also the drivers of political and social change. In Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, it is a younger generation who have been in the lead in demanding their opportunity to shape the future for themselves, their families, and their country. I believe their vision and bravery will also drive progress in solving some of the global problems I have talked about. But it is not just in Africa where young people have found themselves marginalized. The upheaval created by the recent global crisis, financial crisis, has shown that in developed countries too, young people are vulnerable. Job prospects for young people have rarely been tougher as recruitment contracts and redundancies are made. When the economy gets tough, the young ones, the young workers are the first to go. And yet in the modern economies, they are the ones who have the skills, the technological skills uh, to help companies get out of their difficulties. But often they are not unionized, they don't have their seniority, and they are the first to go. As employers, we demand experience. At the same time, we are denying the young people the chance to gain it. We speak of the potential and drive of the next generation, but are reluctant to provide them with real responsibilities and a role in governance. It is these obstacles that the foundation has been busy working to overcome. Franklin D. Roosevelt once remarked that we cannot build the future for our youth, but we can build our youth for the future. I want to congratulate the American Scandinavian Foundation for your determination to foster understanding and your commitment to young people. These goals were important 100 years ago when the foundation was founded they are even more important today. That is why I have no hesitation in congratulating you on your centenary, but also hoping that the best is yet to come. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So first of all, let me welcome you. Thank you. On behalf of ASF, I, I'm very excited to see you again, sir. Uh, my name is Frank Weston, and I uh, chair and I'm the founder of a, an NGO at the United Nations, mm -hmm. the Economic and Social Council. Mm -hmm. The NGO is economic, uh, is, um, sorry, is the International Multiracial Shared Cultural Organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sitting with uh, Dr. Fajeda. We, uh, you invited us to one of your, to one of your ceremonies mm -hmm. at the United Nations, and I mentioned that because she's very shy, or pre pretends <laughs> to be, but she loves it, and she's the reason why I'm here today. Good. She encouraged me to come, uh, and I'm delighted that I did. Uh, first of all, uh, I have a question, but before I get to that quick question, I won't be long, before I get to that question, I really support very much uh, the statements that you've made, and I was concerned about what you would speak about uh, today. So you've surprised me, uh, and I'm quite honored uh, mm -hmm. at, the, at the energy that you put behind mm -hmm. the words in your speech. Uh, yes, we do have a major, major problem uh, in Africa and in society as a whole. <coughs> so my question is, uh, you've said that the Scandinavians in America have done very well and have contributed quite a lot to American mm -hmm. society and the globe as a whole. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, because of their dual citizenship. This is, this, those are my words. Yeah. What IMSCO is doing in order to be able to help meet the, the Millennium Development Goals is we're looking at and focusing on dual citizenship mm -hmm. for 500 million Africans in the diaspora. Of course, all of them are not rushing for that. They're not even aware of it yet, but many of them are. We started this about a year and a half ago. To date, about three million people have signed up. Mm -hmm. So the dual citizenship for African Americans, specifically in this particular case, of course, is not limited to that. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I believe might do a great deal, move us a great deal towards what some of the Scandinavians have, have achieved. Uh, I went into Africa, and I'll mm -hmm. end with this. I went into Africa a few years ago, quite a few years ago, uh, with more Ds on my report card than you could find in the D dictionary. I was completely unmotivated, mm -hmm. uh, had no focus whatsoever. My father basically threw me out of the country, said, get out of here, you're an embarrassment to the country and to the family. Africa turned me around. It showed me things that I'd never dreamed of mm -hmm. seeing before. So my mind became open as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that dual citizenship, uh, which so many have come into America and enjoyed mm -hmm. and prospered, <clears throat> would end up assisting Africa uh, in many ways? Mm -hmm. I believe that the family, uh, uh, half the family is missing. So I'm going to leave it at that. As it was about, okay. The question was dual citizenship. Sorry. Yeah. Well, uh, is, that is a question for the governments, each government to determine for itself. At the beginning, African governments were very hesitant about granting dual citizenship. And in fact, in some cases, when the nationals returned and they had passports from other countries, they treated it as almost a betrayal and sometimes took the or the passport away. But it is changing now. They are offering dual citizenship. But I'm not sure that the so solution would be to offer dual citizenship to every African American. And uh, if you're going to do that, which of the countries offer it and how? And I'm not sure you need the dual citizenship to be able to help in Africa. Uh, let me give you an example. You have lots of American Jews who do a lot to help Israel. Some have dual citizenship, but others don't have citizenship of Israel, but they do help. Uh, on the, uh, the, there are, in the, there are many Africans here who also do help by sending lots of money uh, to help. The, the Lebanese, they have lots of former Lebanese in Latin America, in Brazil, and all that. And they also participate in saying, in fact, once uh, Minister Ambassador of Lebanon called me and said, I have a minister in town and I would want to bring him to meet you. I wasn't a secretary general then. I, I think I was head of peacekeeping operation. And I said, well, what ministry is he in charge of? He said, minister of emigration. I said, you mean immigration? He said, no, emigration. We have so many Lebanese out. They've done well. They make lots of money. So we go and uh, explain to them what the prospects are in Lebanon and encourage them to invest. And they do send lots of money uh, to Lebanon. You know, so that's uh, Lebanese who are sad, but they also work on uh, Lebanese who are Brazilians, who are Mexicans, and, and everything. And so one can help, but I'm not sure the focus of the dual citizenship is the right way to go. And I was wondering.